Would you take your Bibles with me this morning and open to Psalm 15? Psalm 15, uh, which if you have one of the red Bibles, is on page 453, 453. We're continuing our series just of selected psalms. Tom uh, started us out uh, taking uh, the first couple of psalms, and now I'm taking these middle five that we've selected. So uh, this is the second of the five that, that I'll be preaching. So uh, next week, I believe it's uh, Aaron will, will be preaching, and then I'll go with three other psalms. Um, but this morning, just the psalm we've selected is Psalm 15. And uh, I want to ask you one more time, if you're able, if you would stand so that we might honor the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. Psalm 15, a psalm of David. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent, and who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right, and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. Would you remain standing? As we pray once more. Father, would you allow the preaching of your word now to be not a demonstration of the wisdom of man, but a demonstration of the Spirit of God working in power? And would you use the preaching of your word to move us so that our lives as your children are more perfectly conformed to the image of your Son. For we need convicted, would you convict? Or we need comforting, would you comfort? Do all that we need for our good and your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The storyline of the Bible could be told in terms of a return of God's people to God's presence. In the Garden of Eden, it was paradise. God made the man and the woman and placed them there. And the Scripture explicitly tells us that he he was with them in the garden, that God was manifesting his presence among them continually. All was glorious and good. Therefore, when the man and the woman sinned, it wasn't simply that sin and death were introduced into the world as terribly devastating as both of those realities are, it was also true that in that moment, Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. They were expelled from the very blessed presence of God. And so in many ways, the storyline of the Bible immediately following that is a story about getting back to the presence of God. Even as God spoke the word of judgment in Genesis 3, in that very moment, he began speaking about redemption, didn't he? He he pronounced judgment, but also in the very words of judgment, spoke of the day that the offspring of the woman would come and, and crush the head of the serpent. And so just as judgment meant expulsion from the presence of God, so the promise of redemption was telling them that there would be a day in which God's people would be restored to his presence. This is why it is not by mistake that when you get to the pages of the New Testament, and specifically John 1, and John celebrates the glory of the incarnation, here is how he writes it. John 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is coming as a restoration of the presence of God among his people. And then at the end of the scripture, the storyline of the Bible uh, climactically announces Revelation 21.3, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. 
That is our ultimate hope of salvation, this restoration of God's people into God's blessed presence forever. But in tracing out that storyline, I have skipped a major portion of the Bible. You see, in the Old Testament, God kept giving signs and shadows and types and pictures that were showing us that this was his intention in the work of redemption. In the book of Isaiah and in the book of Micah, he foretells of a day in which all nations would begin to flock toward Mount Zion. Well, what's so special about Mount Zion? Mount Zion represented the place where God was manifesting his presence. In fact, it was so clearly seen as the place on which God manifested his presence that it's spoken of at other places in the Bible. We see this in Psalm 2 and in Psalm 3 as God's holy hill. But that's not the only way that God was showing and shadowing and foreshadowing that his redemptive plan was to be uh, bring and restore his presence among his people. He also gave instructions for the building of the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was a tent, a large tent, but a tent. And the reason that God gave instructions for the building of this tent, which would later be replaced by a more permanent structure, the tabernacle, is because God was saying, I am going to be present among my people. The tabernacle ended up symbolizing the dwelling place of God. And when it was built, it was built right in the middle of the camp of Israel. They took it around with them, but always it was set up in the middle of the camp because it was foreshadowing the day when God would restore this blessed reality of His people being with Him and He dwelling with them forever. And it's when we have those categories of God's holy hill signifying his presence, and of this tent, the tabernacle, signifying his presence, that I think we can make sense of the question that David asks at the beginning of Psalm 50 or 15. He says in verse 1, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell in your holy hill? In other words, what David is asking in Psalm 15 is, Lord, what characterizes those people who will dwell in your presence? Or we might ask it this way, what characterizes God's redeemed people? Now, let me draw a clear distinction here. I do not think that Psalm 15 functions so as to say, Here are a list of characteristics, which if you do them and you master them, you can merit and earn your way into God's presence. No, there is only one man who has ever perfectly fulfilled the characteristics of Psalm 15, and he is none less than the God-man, Jesus the Christ. And the only way you and I, and the only way anyone will be able to stand in the presence of God on the day of judgment, faultless, will only be because we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, who perfectly lived, who died for our sins, who was raised from the dead on the third day, and His perfect righteousness has been transferred to us and credited to us by faith. In other words, on that final day, We will stand in the righteousness of Christ alone, or we will not stand. But it is also true that the one who is justified by faith will live a life characterized by righteousness. The one justified by faith alone will have that justification manifested in his life. The way that Jesus pictured that for us was with the illustration of a tree, He says that a good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit, and therefore you can look at the fruit and tell what kind of tree it is. In the same way, you should be able to look at an an individual's life and see evidence of whether or not that person has been justified by faith alone. So the way then I want to approach Psalm 15 is as a reminder to you and me of what should characterize our lives, what our lives should look like. This doesn't have to be a sermon of beating you down and condemning you. In fact, I want to argue, if you know the Lord, then you do not hear the commands of Christ as an oppressive burden. Remember, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Rather, you hear the commands of Christ as something that your heart desires to do. 
And so I want to hold this up as yet another opportunity for us to more perfectly move our lives in line and in conformity to the glorious image of Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Lord. So what I want to do is I want to briefly then note five of these characteristics that David lays out in the text. Characteristics that I'm going to word in this way. I would word them as to say, if somebody were to ask you and me, what should be able to be said about us? If we belong to Christ, what should be able to be said? What should somebody be able to say about us? I think they should be able to say these five things. Number one, we desire righteousness with hearts directed toward obedience. We desire righteousness with hearts directed toward obedience. This is where David begins. In verse 2, in answer to the question he asked in verse 1, what characterizes one who would dwell in God's presence, his answer is, verse 2, he who walks blamelessly and does what is right. Now, when he says walks blamelessly and does what is right, we, we don't need to hear that as if David is saying we must be characterized by sinless perfection. Again, there is only one who could be characterized that way. The idea of being blameless, though, the idea is of being whole or being sound. In other words, the whole of our lives, inside and outside, should be directed towards righteousness and characterized by obedience. In other words, someone should be able to say about you and me if we belong to Christ, they are about obeying Jesus Christ. Not perfectly but you and I, that must be the direction of our hearts and the aim of our lives. Negatively, if someone is not characterized by a desire for righteousness or by a directive of being obedient to the commands of Jesus Christ, then we have good reason to say, then it doesn't look like that person's not giving evidence that they really have a saving relationship with Jesus. Because it is true in the Old Covenant, when God gave the blessed realities, the promises of what would come in the New Covenant as Jesus came, He gave promises like in Jeremiah 31, 34, He would forgive our iniquities and remember our sins no more. That is a glorious thing. We've celebrated this morning when we sang it as well. Oh, 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 you know, glorious is the thought. My sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross. I bear it no more. Praise God for that promise and that reality we find through faith in Christ. But the Old Covenant also said of God's work in the New Covenant, Ezekiel 36, 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And so if someone then professes faith in Christ but does not have the fulfillment of that promise, any kind of desire toward obedience, any kind of uh, compulsion within them to want to walk in God's statutes or to be careful to obey His rules then we might say, like Jesus, they are claiming to be a good tree, but not bearing good fruit, instead of bearing bad fruit. But if that's you this morning, there's hope. If your life is not giving evidence that you really know the Lord Jesus Christ, then here's the call to you. Repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ, who lived and died and was raised, and He will forgive you of your sins, transform your heart, and His Spirit will move you to be transformed. And you can make that public in baptism. I want to plead with you this morning. If you realize that this is, that Psalm 15 is not a descriptive of you, then repent and believe. But for those of you, indeed, who can look and say, I think this is generally true of me. My, I do desire obedience. When I sin, I want to turn from it. I, I want to obey the Lord. Then be encouraged. Be encouraged. and Do not grow weary in being good. Press on and obedience. The first characteristic, the one who will dwell in God's presence, we desire righteousness with hearts directed toward obedience. Second, we speak truthfully and for the good of others. We speak truthfully and for the good of others. What I mean is we speak truthfully and when we speak, our speech is aimed at the good of others. David continues after saying he walks blamelessly and does what is right, he says at the end of verse 2, in the beginning of verse 3, and speaks truth in his heart and does not slander with his tongue. Now, my guess is, if you and I were attempting to answer this question, what characterizes someone who's righteous? 
Or what's characteristic of someone who is unrighteous? My, my guess is if we were to answer that first question, the question David's answering here, we might not immediately go to speech. I mean, isn't that interesting? I mean, he's just generally, the person is blameless, they do what is right. Specific illustration number one, their speech. The reason I think that you and I might not go there immediately is because I think if I were to do a test case and I were to say, imagine someone who lives unrighteously, who, who lives in a vile way, I don't think you would first picture someone saying something. But the reality is that when David says this, he is falling right along in line with the truth that's very clear in the Bible. And one, that truth is this. The tongue, our speech, may be the clearest and truest indicator of the health of our hearts. Our speech can be the truest and clearest indicator of the health of our hearts. Now, if you're thinking, mm, I feel like you're overstating that. Well, let's go back to this illustration Jesus used of the tree that I made reference to. Let me read that for you in the full context. Luke 6, 43 through 45. I think we'll be able to follow the illustration very clearly. Jesus says, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. Again, clear enough, we're following along. Then he gives a specific illustration. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. Again, I think we get that. Then he says this. The good person, out of the good treasure in his heart, produces good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. Four. And now listen how he ends this. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, if you want the clearest indication of someone's heart, look at the fruit of their speech. Because it's out of our heart that our mouths speak and they reveal the health of our hearts. Our speech reveals the, the goodness or evil that is within us. If you want to know a person's heart, listen to that person's speech. So that David then says, specifically within that, in verse 2, we speak truth. He speaks truth in his heart. Later he will say, I'll pick this up uh, in the end of verse 4, he swears to his own hurt and does not change. In other words, our speech should not only be marked as being true, we don't propagate lies and falsehoods, but our speech should also be seen as trustworthy. What we say, we mean. And when we make a promise, when we say something, even if holding to that promise is going to hurt us, we do it anyway. Because our speech is trustworthy. A number of years ago, at uh, the building we used to have over on North Highland, uh, we needed, we had a project, plumbing project that was needed. We needed someone to connect a plumbing pipe out to the street, but in order to do so, they were gonna have to cut through a parking lot. And so we had gotten a number of quotes from individuals, and basically, all of the quotes were at this very, very high price. And then an individual came in, and we got a quote from him, and he was about half that. And so, of course, we said, we're going with that guy. And that guy told us, he said, listen, it'll only be about a day's work. I'll be done. I'll be out of your hair. We said, great. Well, sure enough, he comes one day. He works that day. He's not done. He comes out, and he starts work the next morning, and it seems like he's not making it very far. And Nathan Young, uh, one of our other pastors, was, was with me that morning. We are meeting in the office, and Nate said, I thought that guy said this was about a day's work. And I said, it is. He did say that, and it doesn't look like he's getting very far. And Nate said, well, let's go out and talk to him. So we walk out in the parking lot, and we go up to this guy, and uh, Nathan says, uh, hey, looks like it, the project's just going a little longer than, than you thought it would. And he said, uh, yeah, he said, uh, about that. When I gave you that quote, I knew that your parking lot had asphalt. I didn't realize that that asphalt was sitting on top of 12 inches of concrete. And now I've realized that I've got to cut all the way through 12 inches of concrete this whole way. If I'd known that, I, I would have never given you the quote I did. But, he said, 
but when I give you a quote, I want you to know my word is true. And that's all you're going to be paying. Now, quick side note, Nathan and I agreed, let's pay more money. We did. But what he said is, is, is illustrative of what David is saying here. We swear to our own hurt and do not change. Even if it's going to cost us to be true and to be trustworthy, we allow it to cost us. But David not only says that we speak truth in our heart, but that we do not slander with our tongues. And I wonder how much as believers we think about slander. My guess is if I pick some other areas of, of sinful struggle in our life, my guess is that we have accountability and we, and we really exercise great vigilance in fighting them. My hope is, my trust is, that almost all of us, my hope is that all of us are very vigilant in making sure that what we put in front of our eyes on our phones, our computers, our TVs is pure. My, my trust is that if you're in a dating relationship, that you have some accountability to make sure that you're fighting with great vigilance to make sure that you walk in holiness. Or, or maybe you exercise great vigilance in making sure that you don't live a life of laziness, but whatever your hand finds to do, you do with all your might working as unto the Lord. But it may well be that with regard to slander, we kind of let down our vigilance. That, that we not, are not as driven to make sure that we do not do it. But my guess is that slander has been used of the devil to do as much damage to the church as anything else in all of history, perhaps. It, we could simply tell the stories of church splits that started with slander. With, with speaking evil, with attempting to, to speak behind another's back to bring harm to them, to speak evil of them. And you and I need to see that as unacceptable as stealing or causing physical harm to another or walking in sexual morality. We need to say of ourselves, and may it be true of us, we not only speak truthfully, but we do not slander others. Now, right along with that, then, we come to a third characteristic in the text. We seek to love and do good to our neighbors. We seek to love and do good to our neighbors. David continues the second half of verse 3, and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. In other words, David expands in his specific example of not doing evil to your neighbor. He mentions not taking up a reproach against your friend. In other words, it's not simply that as believers, we do not slander or speak ill of another behind that person's back. It is also true that we do not entertain slander against someone when someone else brings it to us. And the reason it is so important that that is true of us, that not only do we not slander, but we do not entertain slander and gossip against another, is one, as I've already said, negatively, this can destroy a church. If you have a church where we are given to slander and entertaining slander when it comes to us, I promise you, you will see division. But there's also something positive that we will miss if we are marked by slander and entertaining slander, a willingness to take up a reproach against a friend. If that characterizes the culture of who we are as a church, it's going to limit the ministry that we carry out through the power of the Holy Spirit in one another's lives. And let me tell you why. The way that the Lord has designed us is that He calls us to Himself, gives us new hearts, puts a spirit within us, but he also gifts us. But he, not, he doesn't simply gift us for our own sake. He gifts us by his spirit so that we might edify others. In other words, he's arranged us as a body in unity with all kinds of diversity, all kinds of different gifts. And the reason he's given us different gifts is so that we might use them to minister in one another's lives, to encourage, to comfort, to build up. However, if you have a community that is marked by slander and is marked by the willingness of individuals to entertain slander, to, to, to entertain gossip that would tear it on individuals, you and I are going to all of a sudden be very slow to minister according to our gifts in the lives of others. Why? Because we will tell ourselves it's not worth it. Because it is risky. 
What if I attempt to minister and to bring comfort or consolation or encouragement, and yet they see me and their response is to mock me or belittle me or to speak evil behind my back, and my brother takes it. It is safer for me to step back. It is safer for me to, to, to keep myself on the sidelines. Brothers and sisters, but imagine on the other hand, if you have a community in which we not only love one another and seek to do good to one another, but we're not going to slander, we're not going to mock, we're not going to belittle, nor are we going to entertain that. We're going to be the kind of people that others say, don't even bring gossip to him because he won't hear it. When we have that kind of culture as a church, all of a sudden, that love drives out fear and creates safety among us. Where all of a sudden, you and I feel safe and loved, and we can say, I'm going to step out and attempt to share an encouraging word that I think the Spirit may be moving in my heart to share, and then my brother can be built up. I'm, I'm going to step out and minister in this way by the power of the Spirit in order to serve my sister in Christ so that she might be consoled and comforted. And isn't that the glorious community that we want? But that happens only when we have a community that is characterized by love and seeking to do good. We do not slander, nor do we even entertain reproach against our neighbors. Number four, we line up our desires with the Lord's, or with the Lord's desires. We line up our desires with the Lord's desires. Next, David says in verse 4, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. Now again, my guess is if you and I had been charged to come up with characteristics of God's redeemed people, we probably wouldn't write what David wrote, in whose eyes a vile person is despised. Make sure they, they despise the vile person. It can seem weird to us that David would characterize righteousness as, defile, as despising the vile person and honoring those who fear the Lord, but I think it makes good sense, especially if we think of our children. I think there's this God-given reality in our lives so that we want heroes, we want individuals whom we can look up to, to imitate and emulate. I think this is in part the design of the family so that children may grow up looking at a godly father, a godly mother, and wanting to imitate and emulate them. We see it also in a broader way in culture. It's why perhaps as children we've wanted to put up posters of individuals in our bedrooms or as we've gotten older we've admired somebody or wanting to emulate somebody and so you alter your fashion or the way that you live based on wanting to emulate or imitate that individual. Well, let's focus just on children for a second. As parents, if we see that the desires of our children and the things that they value and the things that they are attracted to, indeed the people whom they find valuable and desirable, if those people are walking in vile ways, doesn't that cause concern in our hearts? On the other hand, if we see our children wanting to value and be drawn to and finding as attractive individuals who fear God and love the Lord and want to live godly, doesn't that bring comfort to our hearts? And the reason why is because we know if they are drawn to honor those who are vile and not to value those who are godly, we know that it says something about their hearts, doesn't it? Because one of the characteristics of a mature believer is that we desire what God says is desirable. And we despise what God says should be despised. And brothers and sisters, the whole world is out to shape us at the level of our desires. Even the clothing department store, it is not enough that they put this shirt on a mannequin so that you can walk by and go, I like that shirt, or I don't like that shirt. What they do rather, and you know this to be true, 
is they have images of individuals out living an entire lifestyle because the message that they are sending to us is that is the life that you should desire. And then the subtle message is if you get that shirt, it'll help you get there. But that's everywhere, isn't it? It's not simply get this product, it's you should be attracted to this lifestyle. And so one of the things then we tell our children, even that one of the things that we, we, Lily and I have talked about telling our own children as they grow up, because you're thinking to yourself, I have a 10-year-old, you're not going to be dating anybody at age 10, what, how do I talk to them? Well, here's what you tell your children, and here's what you pray for your children. You pray, I want you to be drawn to and attracted to and find as desirable that which God says is desirable. I want to see your affections shaped. And so, so the world's constantly bombarding you, and that's why you need time in His Word. And that's why we bring our children to put them under the preaching of the Word of God, right? Right? So that just as the world is constantly trying to shape our affections and our desires and our values, we take the word of God and we hold it up to ourselves and we say, God, transform me from one degree of glory to another as I behold the glory of the face of Christ in your word. Shape me because I want to desire what you find desirable and I want to despise what you say should be despised. We align our desires up with the Lord's. And then finally, we value people more than wealth. We value people more than wealth. In the last example, David says, I've already noted the end of verse 4, who swears to his own herd and does not change. In verse 5, David says, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. Now, I don't think that verse 5 is a condemnation of the banking or credit union industries. I don't think that verse 5 is denouncing the practice of loaning money. Indeed, I think that these industries can be good for society, right? One of the reasons I'm able to uh, live in a house that I, um, you know, quote-unquote own uh, is because of this ability. Here, though, is what I think David is condemning. Imagine that you have someone in your community, a friend, a brother, a sister in Christ who is needy, and you have the ability to meet that brother or sister's needs. But instead of seeing this as an opportunity to meet their need, you see this as an opportunity to gain wealth. And so you decide, instead of simply meeting their need, I'm going to meet their need with interest so that I gain from their lowly place. Or again, imagine that you're an official who pronounces judgment and legal matters, and someone comes before you, but instead of seeing this as an opportunity to uh, pronounce justice in a situation, you see it as, again, an, an opportunity to gain wealth, and so you take a bribe, even if it's against the innocent. In other words, what David is saying is believers must be the kind of people in a world where it's so tempting to chase after riches as if it's the highest goal. We must be individuals who value people over wealth. So the question David asks at the beginning of Psalm 15, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? Or what characterizes the life of the redeemed? May it be said of us in answer to that question, we have hearts that desire righteousness and seek obedience. We speak truthfully and for the good of others. We seek to love and do good to our neighbors. Our affections and desires are lined up with the Lord's and we value people more than wealth. Certainly this list is not exhaustive. We could list many other things, but it is representative. It gives us a picture of what it looks like, of what our life should look like as we are being conformed to the image of Christ. Once more, let me make clear, it is only because Jesus Christ has obeyed Psalm 15 perfectly that we will ever stand before the Lord in judgment and be accepted. But it is also true that the one who has obeyed Psalm 15 perfectly empowers us by His Spirit 
to obey this psalm even if we do so imperfectly. He is the one who empowers us to honor Him in the way we live. And the reason that we can even have hope of obeying the psalm is because Christ has taken us as His own and is not letting go. That's where Psalm 15 ends. He who does these things shall never be moved. A repetition of the same thing we're going to see in Psalm 16, that we are not shaken. Those who come to the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, I will never cast out. And so it's from that place of being secure with the Lord, accepted before him because of the work of Christ that forms the foundation for us to then being able to obey his commands. And so here's my hope for us this morning. If you're not a believer, I'm going to plead with you to place your faith in Jesus Christ this morning. Repent of your sins and place your faith in him. And then if you want to talk to me or, or somebody sitting beside you, we would love to talk to you more about that. And then make that public by being baptized. If you are a believer this morning, I want us to look at Psalm 15 as an opportunity. Sometimes I think we can think of conviction of sin as if it's only a negative thing. I've, I've now seen an area where I have been struggling or I've been weak or I've been failing or I've been disobeying. But I think as believers, secure in Christ and knowing we will not be moved, we should see conviction of sin as an opportunity to repent and allow our lives to come more in line with Jesus Christ whom we love. You see, the devil constantly wants to move us to a place of being hopeless. His attack is temptation and condemnation. Sin, 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 and then you sin, and he says, you're condemned. Scripture, on the other hand, think of 1 John 1, is, I write these things to you that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who's the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but the sins of the whole world. In other words, if you sin, there's hope. Confess, repent. And allow your life to be more gloriously shaped in conformity to the image of Jesus Christ who lived for us, died for us, and was raised for us. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to conclude the service as we do every week with an opportunity to come to the table. Because it's by coming to the table that we both remember what Jesus Christ has done for us and by coming to the table that we visibly proclaim that we have heard God's word and we by faith we receive it. And our answer to his commands are yes. By the grace of God, through faith in Christ, we will obey. Now the way we're going to do communion in this time of a pandemic is instead of taking it and serving it to individuals with our ushers, we're going to have two of the ushers come forward and they can go ahead and come if they want. They're going to have masks on and gloves on and what they're going to do is they're going to take the, the servings of the bread and the cup, and they're going to set them out here. And then each row is going to come. And they're going to come from the outside and then come around, pick up a serving, and then go back to their seats from the inside of the row. The first row will come, the second row will follow, the third row will follow, and so on and so on and so forth. And then this area can come at the end of this uh, side. But as we do so, you're going to find that there are two cups stacked together. The bottom one has the bread, the top one has the juice. So you can just take one of those stacked cup servings. And then we're going to, once we all have the bread and the cup, we're going to eat and drink together as a way of corporately proclaiming again, God, we have heard your word. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ. And the commands that he brings us, our answer by faith this morning is yes and amen. So let me pray for us, and then we'll come to the table this morning. Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for the one who perfectly obeyed Psalm 15 so that we might have hope. But also thank you for the one who now empowers us by his grace to live, even if imperfectly, to live in obedience to this psalm. Would you shape and conform your people to make us a clear picture of the glorious image of Christ? In whose name we pray, amen. So why don't you go ahead and the first row come, and then the second row can follow, and so on.